Yeah, welcome everyone to MCO's uh, Philadelphia's virtual event, Christian Healthcare, Living on Mission in Your Work, which we hope will be a very exciting and enlightening um, discussion for you guys. We have panelists from Esperanza Health Center and from Christian Community Health Fellowship, and we tried to pick a kind of a broad range of people who may see things from slightly different perspectives and have different things to um, bring to the discussion. So we'll hear from each of them kind of individually, and I will introduce them as we as we go. And then we've um, purposely tried to make sure we have a good 15, 20 minutes at the end um, between, I think we'll be done by mm, quarter of nine or so, um, depending on maybe a little bit uh, longer than that if the discussion goes really well, but that's kind of the goal. Um, uh, presentation for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes or so, and then discussion for after that. So why don't I open up in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together, for this meeting. We thank you for the folks that you brought to this discussion. Um, we thank you for the audience who's from mainly from Philly, but from also from um, all over the country. Um, and uh, we thank you for that. We thank you for the folks that are here. We thank you, Father, that you are here with us, that where two or three are gathered, you um, are present. And we pray, pray that you will bless this evening. We pray for eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts and minds to receive and ponder, um, hands and feet to um, do your word, to seek your will. Um, we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So for our first person up on our panel, uh, the Reverend Andres Fajardo. Uh, his introduction is as follows. By the grace of God, Andres was saved from spiritual death at the age of 17 and has had the incalculable gift of being a son of God by the mercy of Jesus ever since. He's been living and serving the Lord in Philadelphia since 1996 as a pastor, elder, chaplain, and neighbor. He's been the chaplain at Esperanza Health Center since 2011. So over 10 years. Yay. Woohoo. He is married to Juliet Lee Fajardo, has two children, Eliseo and Felipe, and the family is part of Spirit and Truth Fellowship, a church in the Hunting Park area of Philadelphia. He has, also has an educational degree from an institution you would recognize, but he didn't put that in his bio, so we're going to leave that out. Um, Andres is going to talk about some of the uh, mission and vision type stuff at Esperanza, and then um, some of his own journey and how chaplaincy fits in at EHC. So take it away, Andres. All right, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I, it's good to uh, see a lot of familiar faces, but also definitely a, a several people I don't know, but um, thanks for this opportunity. So uh, just a quick question, uh, Laura. So I'm gonna be doing the, the some of the overview things that, uh, okay, all right. Mm -hmm. So by the way, I wanted to mention that um, at the Esperanza Health Center, as far as I know, the longest standing employee now is Dr. Laura Layer, who um, is, uh, yeah, for sure, I think that's the case. So she now is, as a pediatrician, is on the grandchildren, maybe even great-grandchildren of some of her original pediatric patients. So she wouldn't tell you that herself, but it's true. So uh, thank you for all that you have contributed to God's work here in, in Philadelphia, Laura. Um, so. I'll, uh, yeah, um, Laura gave me about eight, eight different questions and topics to cover in seven minutes or whatever it is. So I'll just do what I, I can here. Um, but here on this folder that I carry everywhere with me is our mission statement of the Esperanza Health Center, which I will read here. This has been the mission statement since probably the third year of the Esperanza Health Center, which now is about 35 years old, 34 years old. So our mission statement is compelled by the love of God in Christ Jesus in cooperation with the church and others. Esperanza Health Center is a multicultural ministry providing holistic health care to the Latino and underserved communities of Philadelphia. So I'll just say quickly, I think probably most people on this call are, are pretty familiar with the history, but just by way of giving a, a thumbnail review quickly, the Esperanza Health Center started in the late 80s because of a vision the Lord gave to Dr. Carolyn Klaus, 
who was part of the Living Word uh, Christian Fellowship in downtown Philadelphia. Their husband was pastoring. And according to her story, which, by the way, she wrote a book about this, uh, Prescription for Hope, uh, which is about maybe the first 15 years or so of the Esperanza Health Center. She became aware at that time that the Latino community, uh, I'm not sure exactly how this was measured, but was the most isolated community from culturally appropriate and accessible medical services. So with a lot of help initially from the church, her specific church, in fact, one particular Bible study, the Esperanza Health Center started out of that vision um, and is still serving the same geographical community, although that the Latino community has grown considerably from the particular area that she was focused on at that point. Um, so I wanted to mention just related to some of the, I guess, the questions that were sent ahead of time, uh, but this question of what makes the Esperanza Health Center distinctively Christian. And that is, uh, as they used to say in the, the old days, the $64,000 question is, uh, I don't think we've totally figured that out. And it's, I think, becoming a little more of a contested issue. But I think that uh, basically from the beginning, the vision has been that, which I, I'm sure everyone here on this call is bought into this vision about health, is that uh, people's health is very much a reflection of being created in the image of God. So we think about the time of creation, Adam and Eve, as we know, are created in the image of God. And created in that image in all respects, uh, physically, in, in, although that's kind of a mystery of uh, how that is exactly, but the, the physical aspect, but also the, the, the social aspect, the psychological aspect, the spiritual aspect, obviously, uh, the communal aspect, uh, and in various other ways. And so then we know, of course, that uh, we fell into sin through our mother and father, uh, Adam and Eve, and that sin uh, cause spiritual death to come into all of those areas. So it makes sense then in joining in with Jesus' work to bring salvation and ultimately salvation to all aspects of the fall that uh, there's going to be a work of restoring all aspects of that. And so the vision from the beginning of the Esperanza Health Center has been to try to live out that holistic aspect, which of course is in the mission statement but there's been a very strong emphasis also, partly because it, it was birthed out of that Bible study and out of the church, that um, the church has a fundamental uh, role in that function of helping to bring healing to the all of the ways in which uh, our image of God in us and in our communities has been compromised by sin. And so wanting to see people... Uh, served and uh, blessed by the, the entire church community has been a very important part from the beginning. So just by way of a, a quick review, I thought I would mention that, and I, I was, um, as a, uh, a someone who's been a pastor for many years here in North Philadelphia, I was brought into the board way back, right around 2000, I think it was, or 1999, I can't remember exactly, but I was on the board for about seven years. And those those were the days when we were uh, always a couple of months away from going out of business. And that went on for a number of years. <laughs> so uh, uh, fortunately, that's not the case by far anymore, but it was for a number of years. But the Esperanza Health Center was about 40 employees for many, many years, uh, even smaller than that for a number of years. And then we kind of began to shoot up about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Uh, and now we're about 200, well, when we're fully staff, which is seems to be never, but we're, we, we, we'd be about 240, 245 um, employees with three sites now, by the grace of God, one of them on the same block that it was started on, North 5th Street in uh, North Philadelphia. And we have about 15,000, give or take, uh, separate patients with about 60,000 visits a year of one sort or another. So there's other aspects of that that I could speak to, but just kind of giving a sense of the, the size of it. And so that, that vision of uh, being an explicit and implicit presence of Christ in all aspects of people's uh, health and lives has been continued to be part of the vision. So a couple of things about that. I think that on a practical level, 
the hope, and I think this has been the case for maybe until very, very recently, you could say that the vision has been that everyone on staff would be involved with explicitly ministering the words of the gospel, the words of Christ, in addition to the presence of Christ to patients and people and clinicians, since I think a number of people related to this call are, are clinicians or are going to be clinicians, uh, have always been encouraged to, to do that. Although, of course, there is that always limit, limiting factor of having about 20 minutes maybe in a, in a visit. And that's where the, the team approach for the holistic health uh, vision is so important of people, and there are people on this call who work in behavioral health. Uh, I don't, nobody in social services here exactly, but but I, and obviously uh, the physical health part as well as uh, dental health. Where Amy's here, um, and then we also have chaplains. Um, uh, but all of those people, including the medical medical assistants, clerical assistants, have uh, historically been encouraged to and had a vision for sharing about Christ. I think, and this might be a question for further discussion, is I think a lot of people who've been around Esperanza for a long time would say that the percentage of people on the staff who have a real fire in their belly to share the gospel explicitly with people um, and do it uh, has probably diminished over time compared to, let's say, 20 years ago or something. But uh, that's kind of a larger discussion. But that still remains generally the, the vision. I think a challenging part, given this is addressing some of the questions that people have, is what exactly does our mission statement mean? So when I read the mission statement, that is literally the only theological document that we have that is officially affirmed by the organization. In our, uh, since I was on the board of directors, we have a small sentence in the bylaws, which nobody reads, but there they are, that is that the mission of the Esperanza Health Center is to uh, further the cause of uh, historic confessional Christianity. Uh, so we have this half sentence, compelled by the love of God in Christ Jesus. So there were a couple of questions about how, how do we maintain the and speak to and discuss some of the contested issues related to what exactly that means. And so I think what that means exactly, what is the love of Jesus, is becoming an increasingly uh, debated issue among Christians. Esperanza Health Center was pretty much birthed out of the setting of what you could call uh, conservative evangelical Protestant churches in the inner city. And that was where almost all of the employees came from for, you could say, maybe the first 20 years or so. Then that began, began to get broader in terms of the uh, the, pay, the uh, employee base uh, after that. And so, and I would say increasing in increasing degree in, in recent years is more of a question of on some of these contested issues, how do we decide them and who decides them? So I would say there's hasn't been a, really a definitive approach right now, except that it's kind of, um, let's say a process of putting off definitive decisions about it. Um, I only mentioned that because that was part of one, some of the questions that people had submitted, which I guess could come up more in the, the question and answers. But I wanted to mention a, a particular patient situation, which I think brings out a lot of what we hope to do. And we don't always do it perfectly, but what we're, what we're really hoping to do. So there's a patient that many of us knew because she's now passed away called Janet King. I can say her name because her entire story was published in our newsletter, and she wrote a whole um, essay about it, actually. So she, even though the majority of our patients are of some kind of Latino background, uh, she was actually Jamaican. We, we don't have that many Jamaican immigrant um, patients, but she was one of them. So her story, I think, is very moving and was a real blessing to see unfold. So she came to us as an uninsured patient. I'm not sure how exactly she started as a patient, but she had gotten a diagnosis of cancer. So um, her clinician and the social services person worked very hard to get her covered under some kind of emergency care related to, to cancer treatment. And in the midst of that, she all of a sudden became homeless because of uh, an issue at her, home, at her uh, housing situation. So 
she then was found a place um, it, next to the house of someone on our staff that could take her in basically free. Uh, she began going to the church in one of our, that's near one of our um, clinics that a lot of the staff are part of. She became part of a Bible study. And she then began to really engage some of the aspects of the gospel, which she said she'd always believed, but she'd never really taken very seriously and what it looked like in her own life. And one of the things that she was facing the issue of, unless something really changed, that uh, a terminal diagnosis of cancer that really weighed on her as she looked towards the ends of her life. And that was that she had a, uh, a had had a broken relationship with her mother uh, in Jamaica and her sister in Florida for many, many years. That was very important to her. And as God began to work in her heart and began to see uh, Christians around her that were engaging her in friendship and she with them, she really wanted to address this in her life. And so to make kind of a long story short through the involvement of the church and other people she'd gotten to know at Esperanza, she reached out to her mother and her sister. And basically through a, a process, they be, got reconciled with each other. And then probably about six months later, she passed away from cancer. But she said very clearly that that had been her greatest hope uh, beyond having a deeper relationship with Christ was to repair these relationships before she passed away. And if she didn't want to die, she, she hoped she would get healed, but she didn't get healed. Uh, but if that wasn't possible to have that happen uh, before she went on to be with the Lord. And this, that whole process for me, uh, and I think for everyone who was involved and multiple people in our clinic were involved with her life, really brought out what was a, a well, a blessed, very blessed process to be involved in and to see how, yes, she was getting uh, medical care that she really appreciated. And she had a lot of wonderful things to say about everyone involved in her life uh, in the medical care. And at the same time was dealing with the, this uh, social aspect of her life, obviously the family aspect and also the spiritual aspect, which was transformative in those things. So and then her her uh, funeral was done at that church that she'd become part of, which is half a block away from one of our clinics. So for me, that for all the people that were involved in, in Janet's life through the clinic, since we're kind of focusing on that here, that really uh, symbolized or embodied why we were doing what we're doing, what we hope to be involved in. There were a lot of tough times, a lot of tears in, in her story and so on. Nevertheless, it was something where you could really see the hand of the Lord uh, explicitly working throughout her whole life, except, of course, we know she wasn't healed of cancer, although I think the cancer treatment she got did actually extend her life for a while. So I wanted to just, I thought that story would be a very good way to, to um, embody a lot of things, Laura. I, I, I'm not sure how much time I have. Did you want me to say something about myself, or is that pretty much good for the moment? Um, I think we're good, Andres, but thank All you right. very much. <laughs> okay. Um, we can we can hear more of your story maybe in the Q&A time. All right. Okay, cool. Thank you. That very illustrative um, uh, patient case, I think, again, of how um, physical care, spiritual care, um, relational care, social work type care can happen in the setting at Esperanza. Um, great, great example of teamwork. Our next guest, our next panelist is Steve Noblet. Since 2007, Steve has served as a CEO for Christian Community Health Fellowship, or CCHF, which is a nationwide community of Christian health professionals committed to living out the gospel through healthcare among the poor. There are over 300 health clinics in the CCHF network, each one committed to providing distinctively Christian health care to medically underserved and under-resourced people in America. Motivated by a passion to see Christ and his kingdom fleshed out in real life, Steve and his wife, Victoria, live and work to see Christ demonstrated to the growing number of unreached people who live in our own cities. He has worked in ministry and Christian community development for over 30 years, and he has had involvement in ministries all over the world. He's led several inner city churches and currently serves as an elder at Christ Community Church in Memphis. 
Steve's going to share a little bit of his personal story and the work of CCHF. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm glad to uh, see you all today, tonight. Um, so CCHF, for some of y'all may not be aware, is is kind of now the, the parent company, if you will, for MCO Philadelphia. And we're really, MCO Philadelphia is a very unique part of CCHF, and uh, we're all learning from each other on these things. So it's really good. But um, yeah, I, I'll i try to keep mine pretty brief. I, um, I've i been walking with the Lord for, for uh, it'll be, it'll be, well, for 49 years. So that's a long time. And, um, and I think, I think that the, the best counsel that I've ever received from anybody that's really helped me in my walk with the Lord and helped me remain faithful and, and, and really helped me live uh, really an adventure of following Christ was uh, a, a brother told me many years ago, he said, Steve, find out what God's doing in your generation and align yourself with that. And um, there, there's a scripture, uh, it's not, I wouldn't call this my life first, but it's a scripture that is, that's meant a lot to me over the years. It's a, it's one of those little throwaway verses that you've never heard preached on. It's, uh, it's in um, the Apostle Paul's first recorded sermon. And, um, and it, and it's in Acts chapter 13, and he and basically Paul, in the middle of his sermon, he says, David, when he had served the purpose of God in his generation, he closed his eyes. You know, he, he fell asleep. He went on to be with the Lord. He died, you know. But but that little phrase, David served the purpose of God in his generation, has always inspired me that there is a purpose of God to be recognized in our generation. And while it may, it's consistent with God's eternal purpose for of all time, in our generation, it looks, it looks unique. It looks, it's, it's something that is countercultural, but redemptively so, not just, um, not just in a judgmental way, not in a judgmental way, but in a life-giving way. And so uh, there's another verse that scares me that's very similar. It says that the Pharisees missed the purpose of God for themselves. And, um, and so what scares me about that is I think it's possible to miss the purpose of God. I think uh, you can miss that. And, and things didn't go well for most of the Pharisees because of that. And so I think recognizing what is God's purpose and aligning yourself with that is uh, is really what it's what it's all about. The scripture um, that that I think helps me a lot. There's 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 several places where you can really where the purpose of God is just absolutely crystal clear and uh, and is spelled out. The first chapter of the book of Ephesians is one of those, and the first chapter of the book of Colossians is another one. They're very parallel passages. And in Colossians chapter one, it says, all things were created by him, talking about Jesus, and for him. So that tells you that there is a purpose. Like one of the questions is, what is the purpose of healthcare? You know, why, what is healthcare for? Well, it finds its fulfillment in, in that it was created, it was one of those things created for Christ. The, it goes on to explain, and, and, and it says, and it talks about the things that, that were created for Christ, and we tend to want to reduce it down to people. We were created for Christ. The, our neighbors were created for Christ. Everybody was created for Christ, and they either miss that or, 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 they, or they find that. They, 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 they're redeemed into it. They're reconciled into that. But, he's, but he goes on and he says, he says, things, whether principalities or powers or authorities, and, and he's talking about systems and institutions. Um, and, and so there are powers and authorities are, are, are systems that are required for us to thrive as a society or as a culture. Jesus didn't come just to redeem a whole lot of individuals and leave us as a whole bunch of individuals but actually 
being born again is the first step to what he really redeemed us for, which was the kingdom of God. I, I really don't believe that Jesus came to, to uh, create a new world religion. I think Jesus came to inaugurate and introduce us to a kingdom. And that kingdom is a, a system of life. It's the only workable system of life. It's the only one that it's the only one that has any future or any possibility. We've tried all the others and they're falling apart. COVID exposed it all. And uh, including some of the false things that, that the church has built itself around and the way that we've become it, it, corrupted in the it, it, as we've adopted pieces of the culture that don't belong to the kingdom of God. He's, he came to introduce the kingdom of God. And so when he says all things, he says, he's saying that, that he has an interest in all these different institutions, the institution of education, the institution of uh, healthcare, the institution of commerce and business, of criminal justice, of, of military and defense, uh, uh, you name it, you, all these different institutions are things that he has an interest in. And so CCHF is a, um, we're a very hopeful group of people because we really believe that the answer to the brokenness in healthcare and the brokenness in our nation, the brokenness worldwide, globally, is the kingdom of God. And what we have done or what we're trying to do is constantly ask ourselves, how does the kingdom of God inform medicine? How does it inform the way that we as individual participants in this, in the, in the institution of healthcare, um, make decisions? How do we, how does it inform the way we relate to our patients, the way we relate to one another? Uh, if Jesus were the head of healthcare, what would healthcare look like? Well, Jesus is the, the head of healthcare, and you're his ambassador. You're not just a cog in the wheel. And, uh, and as an ambassador, what that, uh, think about that term for just a second. An ambassador is a government official that has great authority from the government that he's sent from or she is sent from, but they are seconded, if you will, to a foreign culture. Uh, but they're there to represent the interests and the culture of the government that's, that, they, that sent them. And here we are, each one of us in this, in this call is an ambassador of Christ to the institution of healthcare and other things too. And so how do we think, how does that shape the way that you think? So when we take a look at, we, we look at healthcare in the United States, and um, I'm going to try to keep this really brief, but as wonderful as it is, it's very broken. We have the best healthcare resources. We have the best healthcare education. Uh, we have, we spend more money on healthcare than we, than any other nation. And we still have among the worst health outcomes of any developed nation in the world. And we still have the largest number of people uh, in our country who have barriers to access that health care. And so if we're ministers of reconciliation, part of our job is to reconcile as much as we can, whether that's a tiny one fraction of a degree, but, but to move the needle in health care because we're in it a little bit more towards the justice and righteousness and redemption that we have in Christ, and that He wants that He that He wants to see applied in healthcare. So that's why Esperanza is in Kensington, Allegheny. That's why um, I, I was talking to a group of doctors this earlier this morning that are uh, working in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco. It's why we have a clinic in Skid Row. It's why we have. A, it's why we've had clinics in Sandtown in Baltimore. Um, my, my mother, when she was alive, she used to th think that I had this amazingly exciting job because I got to go to all these exciting cities around the country. My mother never traveled. She was she lived in rural Mississippi most of her life, and she never like Memphis was the big city for her, you know. And so, you know, she'd say, "Well, you get to go to Chicago and New York and all these places." And I I, I didn't have the heart to tell her that when I go to Chicago and New York and Esperon and and to Philadelphia and all these places is to visit the parts of town that everyone else is avoiding. 
But this is where, this is what it means to think missionally. We have a mission, a vision statement that says that we envision a movement of God's people who choose daily to minister healing in marginalized communities in the name of Jesus. And I'm excited to say that like CCHF is not that movement. That movement is way bigger than CCHF, but we see it happening. We see, we're seeing your generation in far greater numbers than my generation who, have who are rising to that and say, hey, that's why I got into medicine. That's what I got into medicine to do. I want to, I want to represent Christ by using my skills, laying them at his feet, and by using my skills to serve the, the poorest and the neediest communities in that, that I can, whether that's here or abroad. And it's exciting to me to see that. And so um, I just want to say that you have this great opportunity to not miss the purpose of God in your generation and to be a part of a movement that I think is really aligning itself with that. So I'll stop with that and uh, maybe answer some questions later, but thank you for this time. Yeah, very cool. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, our next panelist is Dom Derenge. Dominic Derenge loves Jesus. Everybody wrote their own introductions, just so you know. <laughs> Dominic <laughs> Derenge loves Jesus. He lives with his wife and two children in North Philly and works at Esperanza Health Center as a do doctor of osteopathic medicine. And I think, is his sister Candace still a fourth year at Jefferson? Is that, is that still the case? Is she done? Uh, no, she actually, she graduated and moved to Phoenix. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Is she in residency there? No, she's, uh, well, no, she, well, so she did residency at Jeff, actually. And then uh, now she's a hospitalist. Um, oh, cool. Phoenix, so. Very good. All right. So, yep. Dom, a doctor of osteopathic medicine at Esperanza. And Dom is going to share a little bit of his personal journey and what his work likes, looks like at EHC. So, um, hello everyone, thank you for having me. Um, like I said, I'm Dominic, uh, usually go by Dom, but um, I, um, my wife and I uh, moved to Philly, let's say like 2015 or so, <clears throat> um, or 2014 maybe, um, to start residency. And um, we just picked a big city and went there because we didn't really feel like spend time separate. Um, and when I was in residency, um, one of our faculty, I just kind of overheard them talking like, so I could, I mean, they weren't like trying to be secretive, but they said, oh, Dom's a Christian. He's going to work at Esperanza. Um, and, and I didn't, they didn't really, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about Esperanza at that point in time. Um, and so fast forward to when I was nearing graduation, I started looking into jobs and, oh, it turns out, you know what, they're probably right. Um, and uh, this is kind of the kind of place that, uh, you know, got me excited about being, uh, you know, choosing medicine um, for my career to start with. So, yeah, so I started working here. I'm a, I'm a family doctor. Um, I've been working at the site on Fifth Street and at the Hunting Park location for, for about four and a half years now. Um, I do full spectrum outpatient family medicine. So I do um, hep C, HIV care, prenatal care. Um, and yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's my job. Um, a couple other things that how, um, what is, what is, uh, how is my, my work uniquely Christian, um, versus how it would be otherwise. Um, it's, 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 it's hard to, you know, it's hard to answer the theoreticals like that sometimes, but um, I think definitely having, you know, um, thank, thanks Steve for, you know, those, those, those reminders. And I think when, when you're doing it day in and day out, it's so easy to, 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 to get sucked in the routine of just busyness and everything like that. And um, thanks be to God that, that, that he uses, like he, he, he uses us in spite of our attentiveness to his, his, his plans and his, his moving lots of times. Um, so I've, I've experienced that. Um, and um, my, 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 the care that I provide is uniquely Christian in that my, my faith allows me to, 
it, 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 it's developed this over, over the past years. Of, <laughs> this might sound a little bit um, I don't know about uncaring or just rough, but but to, to, to be able to release my control of people's health and to be able to sit back and to listen without having my mind spinning a thousand miles an hour about how I'm going to treat this next condition they're talking about or uh, and just listen and 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 hear where they're coming from and and sometimes just uh, you know you, you know talk about big picture type stuff like you know like so so why you know and I kind of ask them, ask people to, to, to join me in that, to think so, 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 so why are, like, you know, what are the, the stress and the issues that are contributing to all these things that are going on in your life? Like, like, and kind of just to ask questions and to, to be able to, to not, <laughs> to step out of my doctor role a little bit into more of a, yeah, just, just kind of a, uh, more of a blank slate, more of someone who, who's just there to listen and to reflect and to, I mean, eventually I'll provide my perspective and my, my recommendations as, 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 a, as a physician, but um, to be able to release that in some ways is, 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 is helpful to me to, yeah, because I know that ultimately I'm not the one that's going to be healing them um, or, you know, saving them ultimately and that I'm not what they need ultimately, really. Um, and so, yeah, um, that's, that's, I think is, is I, I like things unique about the way that I, I care for patients and obviously playing, praying for folks um, and encouraging them. And, and honestly, you know, in, in when, when, when approaching death and in discussions about end of life stuff and cancer diagnoses and, you know, to, to be able to, to actually have, I, I had a talk to a patient about, about their cancer diagnosis recently. And there was just, I, I never actually said like, you're gonna be okay. <laughs> like, you're, you're, you're gonna go be, be with our, our father. And, and that went over fine. And like, it, it was, I, I, I think thinking back, I was like, that could have been very insensitive or very, you know, I don't know. And, but, but it just, it just, it just, for some reason it wasn't. And the Holy Spirit made it, made it work. <laughs> I don't know how, <laughs> but, um, so, so yeah, so that's that. Um, Lloyd, uh, did you want me to talk more about, you mentioned. Um, you could also talk, if you, you have a minute or two to talk maybe how about working at Esperanza um, and, and living in North Philly kind of affects your balance of your family life. And, um, and also, like you said, um, kind of interacting and, and helping patients kind of use you as a sounding board and act in some ways unloading on you to a degree, mm -hmm. how you carry that um, and, um, and release that, like you said, what, what does that mm -hmm. look like in the day-to-day? -day? Do, and that does, does that affect your family life at all? Well, it does. I, I, it's 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 the Holy Spirit that you know allows that to be a sounding board. I I really don't have any other answer than that. I think I think it's it's when you know when I when I'm when I'm connected to the vine, when I'm abiding in Him, and being faithful with with keeping my eyes focused on Jesus, then it's really amazing what what, what God can do. You know, and and what I've seen Him do, and just I've been surprised at the things that He's done. Um, just, you know, from patient interactions that are us, like, 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 not, not, not screaming at each other, but like me being, you know, berated <laughs> verbally turning into like laying hands on a patient and like praying for them and like, you know, mutually encouraging each other at the end of an appointment. Like that's just crazy. You know, like it's, it's really, um, really crazy stuff that, 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 that happens and, and, to, to so so yeah that's that, that's it. that's it i mean <laughs> uh, this this job can be stressful um and overwhelming and overworked and uh, there's too much paperwork like a, like any other job um and you can get behind sometimes and you have to chart you know after hours or early in the morning and 
but that's that's it wherever you go. You know, it's not that's not that's not unique to, to Esperanza. Um, but that's good, you know. And he he would probably yeah, but he will he would be good if I didn't work here as well too. Um, but it, it it is cool. So so one other I think cool aspect of care here is that is that having it uh, having having my brothers and sisters around me um, to provide that spiritual aspect of care and to to to, to, to that's that's just that's just that's just yeah that, that's really really cool to see that you know that um, someone who like I ran short on time for an appointment and I and I hear you know the social services you know uh, consultant praying for them um, as I'm going from one room to the next room afterwards and um, like oh yeah like like you know they yeah just 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 to just to to, to know that I'm not alone in that at all is is huge um, also because it just helps to you know, combat the, the enemy's lies of guilt or accusation or condemnation about for, for not being enough in that regard too, as if I could be, right? Um, and um, as far as, well, <clears throat> so I, I mean, my work from that. So work, um, working at Esperanza has been really great, especially through COVID. I mean, like we, Y'all were, were, were our, our community and our family pretty much through, through COVID, so so that was that was real, you know, because we didn't stop going to work, which was which was a huge blessing, as far as not being, you know, feeling that the isolation and you know, trapped feeling that many many many, you know, I know many many people did um, during the COVID years, but um, so yeah, that, that was a huge huge evidence of grace there. Um, but that's it. Great, thanks, Dom. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, we'll have some Q and A with Dom later, probably. Okay, cool. Um, our next panelist is Amy Liao, DDS. Uh, has been working at a dent as a dentist at Esperanza Health Center in Philadelphia since two thousand nine. So coming up on what fifteen years in twenty twenty four, right? God is teaching her about solidarity with the poor as well as the abundance mindset. She also lives in Kensington with her husband, Jeremy, and her new baby, Jules, who is very cute. She loves MCO and CCHF. She wrote that. I'm just reading it. She wrote that. I'm just reading it. Um, so thank you, Amy. Um, and uh, please tell us a little bit about your journey and um, what your work looks like at Esperanza Health Center. Sure. Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, how I got here. I grew up in Canada and we moved across the border to <laughs> Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I did my high school, college and dental school. And um, so I'm pretty much like a Midwest girl. And I went to school with a lot of East Coasters and I admired their toughness <laughs> that I did not see <laughs> in my <laughs> really chipper <laughs> Midwest self. And so um, I, I thought, you know, maybe, um, maybe I should challenge myself and seek, I just, I just wanted to do what God wanted me to do, or my idea of what I thought God wanted me to do. <laughs> and then found Esperanza on the internet. Um, I love the idea of going to Spanish school. Um, Esperanza paid for two months of Spanish language training in Guatemala, kind of like the mission organization, go to language school first and then um, come speak the language of the people <laughs> where you are. And, um, and honestly, it was the only job I was offered <laughs> because I had another job lined up in public health in Philly and then it fell through because I'm left-handed and they did not have the funds for left-handed equipment at the time. So I sit on the left of my patient and that can sometimes affect um, just, yeah, costs and equipment and, and all that. So, um, yeah, I, I think God is gracious in that, you know, I, I didn't, for me, for my personality, I, I did not come with any expectations. Um, I just, it's kind of my style of life, just cluelessly rolling along, <laughs> seeking, seeking the Lord, but I was not intentional, really. I didn't know, I, I, I had ideas, like, oh, 
probably, you know, speakers at church or something talking about the city or whatever. And then, um, but it's not like I really research, like, what, what am I getting into? Or like, what am I doing? And same with dentistry. It's like, you know, I, a friend from church was, was in dental school when I was in high school and, oh, that's cool. Like, yeah, my parents didn't want me to be a musician and then kind of urged me to hang out with this friend. <laughs> he shared about dental dentistry and I was like, okay, yeah, I guess like I can do this. And I have, I have lots of testimonies of just God providing and like not me, you know, not always, um, uh, having the discipline, but, um, yeah, just kind of rolling, rolling through, um, didn't, didn't really know anything about Philly except like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, <laughs> Boys and Men, <laughs> huge fan. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm here. And then I think throughout my life, like I didn't know what to expect, but every, every, every step has been just one page at a time of reading, reading God's story for my life. And um, looking back, I can see that God really um, prepared this job just for me and also like prepared me for this job over, over all the different seasons of, of life. And, and it's a job, you know, I prayed for like, God, give me something like this career that I can do, or like help me to get into dental school, <laughs> help me to pass dental school <laughs> every every week. It's like help me pass this test, and then um, you know, crying all the time, and then feeling <laughs> super stressed, <laughs> and then you get there, and it's like, okay, then what's next? Well, you know, ultimately this job has kept me close to God. And that I've been able to see God working in my life, in the life of my patients, in the life of our community. And it's it's challenging enough that I need God every day. And it's um, joyful enough that I could keep doing it so far. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, I landed in Philly, was sleeping on my friend's couch for five months and then um lived in Chinatown for a couple years commuted into North Philly and I don't know that some like a friend had lived in Chinatown for a summer and I was like I want to do that so I yeah God let me do that and then um I was thinking about what am I going to where am I going to live next after our lease was coming to an end. And then um, do I want to live in Chinatown? Do I, move do I want to move closer to work? Um, and then, yeah, and I was thinking about like, maybe I should buy a house. And then literally someone at church told me, oh, Amy, you don't want to buy a house as a single woman. You want to do that when you, you know, with your husband or whatever. <laughs> and then I was like, do I? <laughs> do, is that is that something where does that come from um you know these are christian people <laughs> getting advice and um then later I, I met uh someone from my church who actually owned her house near my near our office i had no idea it was how close it was i, I started volunteering at her house on sundays she would have neighborhood kids come over for like kind of like a Sunday school program. And she bought her house as a single woman at the age of like 25, 24, 25. And then so that idea was like, oh, maybe, maybe I could do something like that too. And yeah, so God just opened up this opportunity to buy a house uh, really close to work. Um, and again, I, I didn't know, you know, what anything would look like. I was just kind of going, turning the page, page by page. And um, so I've been here for 10 years on this block, um, and, uh, yeah, really good financial decision. It was less than $60,000. like, this is cheaper than a year of tuition <laughs> of my student loans. And then, um, 
I was able to live with some coworkers, uh, different people um, over the years, uh, running to work for, you know, my commute is like four minutes, <laughs> always late. Um, and four minutes walking. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> slightly downhill. So it's a little bit faster on the way to, on the way there. Um, and yeah, just being able to experience a lot of community. Um, my uh, old roommate, we would always joke like we have all this unintentional community because people would be talking all around us about intentional community, and I didn't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we would, we would have all this, um, you know, lots of neighbors, a lot of neighbor kids come over all the time. And, um, it was, it's pretty fun. I got married almost six years ago. Um, my husband is like a student theology nerd person. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just, I loved everybody's questions. I, I'll put my uh, number in the chat if anyone wants to like talk more. Um, I, this kind of like all I do is like process life all the time. <laughs> and, um, and uh, yeah, all the, all the issues about uh, church, uh, sexuality, gender, uh, um gen z uh <laughs> theology of healthcare, uh poverty all that stuff um i just yeah that's that's what i love to process so um my day job i practice general dentistry um sorry there's a a chatty baby in the room. Um, and yeah, so I, I do mostly like we say bread and butter dentistry, a lot of uh, fillings, extractions, some root canals, some dentures, um, and a lot of education. Um, I do have uh, just as I've learned more about the American dental industrial complex. I just have a lot of like things about it that eat at my soul. Just like big healthcare, big insurance, all these um, powers and principalities. Uh, so in recent years, I've been talking more about with patients, trying to talk more about sugar addiction, um, our food supply apply that we have available to us that's marketed to us that is destroying our teeth and our livers and, and everything else and um and just yeah trying to provide a lot of education for patients um because den dental surgery is like a pretty downstream intervention um you know just drill in the tooth <laughs> or take out the tooth um and yeah, I'm trying to think through how to, um, for the whole community, like there's no way that we can offer dental services to, to like treat all the dental disease in the world. Um, it's globally, it's very much a service for the very wealthy. And um, so, yeah, I just want to, I've been thinking a lot about just more upstream interventions, which is healthy, healthy diet, healthy lifestyle, healthy breathing, healthy posture, um, healthy relationships, <laughs> um, peaceful relationships and no trauma to the face. And um, so, yeah, um, just that's what I <laughs> do on the, daily basis and um looking forward to the q a uh i think um yeah i spent most of my life just living my own schedule and now i can't do that exactly to full extent um but i yeah i'll be figuring out um like balancing 
career and mom life as Jules gets older, more mobile, more talkative, and um, more independent. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Amy. And I think um, also to emphasize maybe when it comes to that, you are working in an environment that is supportive of families pretty much um, and living in an environment that is supportive to families and motherhood. Um, and you, I know you've got some some decent help within your own network and families um, um, between yourself and your and your and your husband um, to provide some some care for the new little one. So um, bolstering that support system within the church, within the community, within your within your family network can always be helpful to balancing um, motherhood and and working. Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, our next panelist is Suin Lee, MDiv LCSW. Suin has been a behavioral health consultant at Esperanza since 2013. 10 years now. I didn't know that. Cool. Very cool. She first heard about EHC from a neighbor in Kensington, neighborhood of Philadelphia, where she was living as part of a residency program with the Simple Way, where she was living as um uh which is a uh, Christian nonprofit and intentional community. Once the neighbors said that the staff prays for her at Esperanza Health Center and that it feels very good that they do that, Suin was determined to find out if Esperanza had a behavioral health department. Suin received her BA and MSW from the University of Pennsylvania and an MDiv from Alliance Theological Seminary focusing on intercultural studies. She's worked in community mental health in Northern New Jersey and as a youth pastor at her home church prior to coming to Esperanza. Sue in, take it away. Yeah, so when I moved to Kensington um, in 2012, I arrived very broken. I basically had burnt out royally, massively three times during my 20s. I burnt out of grad school for um, the MSW. I burnt out of my uh, first job out of grad school working in community mental health proceeded to burn out in youth ministry as well. And it became clear to me that, you know, this pattern keeps repeating because it's something in the way how I'm functioning and, and God made it very clear to me uh, by the end of my twenties that the way I was relating to him and even relating to myself was not healthy. I was very much trying to do all these things like performing, earning, not so much earning salvation, but almost like earning God's approval. Cause I used to think that God was always just perpetually disappointed in me. Um, and, and I realized that more important than me trying to do stuff for God is my actually relationship with God. Like that's what God cared about more. Um, so that's why I decided to come to Philly to learn a way of ministry that was really more about being rather than doing. That was just about being my full, present, authentic, broken self rather than me trying to make stuff happen or trying to be a perfectionist. Um, and so, yeah, so I came to Philly to learn how to just be a neighbor and, and just do ministry, but not in any kind of a formal way, just the ministry that we all have as the people God created us to be, to be faithful to um, the people, the situations that God has placed us in. And so when I heard about Esperanza, I was like, oh, snap, I need to work there. And I would, anytime I would meet anyone, I'd be like, I want to work at Esperanza. Hi, I want to work at Esperanza in hopes that someone had a connection. So that's actually how I got the job was I proceeded to do that, everyone I met. And then it was through another uh, mutual friend of uh, me and Amy's that they had just moved into, Ken into the Kensington neighborhood. And through them, I met Amy, um, who like was living two blocks away from me. And through Amy, I got in touch with my former boss, uh, my former supervisor. And um, so that's kind of how that all came to be. Um, and... And it's been nine years and I have not burnt out. I've seen it. I'm like, whoa, there's the burnout right there, but I've not burnt out. And I think that goes to show the grace of God and how God has worked in my life. And what I've learned 
um, about, yeah, that ministry of presence. So as a behavioral health consultant, um, our model of mental health is integrated with primary care. So instead of the traditional uh, therapy model of meeting with someone 45 minutes to an hour a week, we do 15 to 20 minute consultations with patients that come in to see their providers. Um, and we, and it's, what's cool about this model is that it gives access uh, for patients to mental health who might not be seeking it out or who might not even know that what they're experiencing is, is mental health related. So I kind of sneak in there telling people like, you know, my profession, I talk to patients about self-care and healthy habits, healthy lifestyle and stress management, because we all experience stress. It's impossible to avoid and it can affect our health. And uh, so we screen for depression, anxiety, often end up also screening for children, ADHD, even bipolar disorder symptoms, PTSD. It's a lot of education that we end up doing. Um, as well as teaching some basic strategies and interventions to cope. Um, and what's also great about it is that we've, unfortunately, a lot of people have had really negative experiences with outpatient therapists, especially in our community. They don't always receive the most professional care. And um, so we get some people who might be jaded, closed off, but because people, um, some people come so regularly to the doctor's office if they have chronic issues every few months. Um, there's There's been patients who have been able to really make connections with people in my department who would, would have never have sought it out because they don't trust therapists. But we just kind of like sneak in there and wedge ourselves in there. And, and um, we've had people disclose trauma that they've never told anyone about. Um, we've had people... Just also just really experience God in powerful ways. Um, I think what's humbling is that um, a lot of times I see God do great things and it's like, I had very little to do with it. Like a, a patient will come in with this like amazing testimony and it actually really encourages me and helps me to not be so mad at God. Cause when I see so much suffering in the world, it makes me pretty angry and wondering why God allows that. But if, when I talk to a patient who has been through horrific trauma and they say to me, mi Dios es bueno, I'm just kind of like, well, I guess I have to believe you if if you say that, I like, I guess you're right. Um, so it's really encouraging just seeing the faith that our patients have. Um, and it's it's very easy to talk about faith in, in my role because it's a very natural thing to bring up, um, asking people about, I bring it up casually, like, oh, yeah, a lot of people really find spiritual practices to be helpful for managing stress. Like, do you identify with faith or do you have any spiritual practices? So that's like a very easy conversation to have. Or even saying how social support is really important and how a faith community can become like a second family for many people. And that also like leads to natural conversation about the topic. And so I just try to meet the patient. Uh, where they are, um, because it's not my it's not my job to change behavior. I it's like I'm I'm not interested in external behavioral change because, like Jesus said, you could just be a whitewashed tombstone, looking nice on the outside and on the inside full of death. Um, I I feel that any sin pattern underneath any sin pattern there is a legitimate emotional spiritual need that that a person is trying to fulfill but in all the wrong ways all the wrong places um so i try to more kind of address that rather than just on external behavior really addressing the underlying motivation or what that person truly is seeking because i do believe that all desire ultimately leads to god that's the fulfillment of our desire it's what makes us different from buddhists who um uh, they kind of find nirvana through kind of losing, letting go of all desire, but we get our desires fulfilled. And so I try to kind of get more to the bottom of that and, and to, again, like be present, be someone who listens. That's the most powerful thing that any of us can do in any of our prof professions is be fully present, engaged, listening, putting our agendas to the side. I've, I've heard from patients who 
they when they complain about experiences with doctors that it wasn't a good experience it's always like the doctor not making much eye contact not listening not paying attention just doing what they think they want to do anytime i hear about good experiences quite often from our own providers it's like oh they really listen to me they care um, so that really, instead of trying to solve problems, caring and listening and being present goes a really, really, really long way. And and in, in meeting people where they're at spiritually, it, it's it's kind of like trying to kind of like almost lead people to the next step, not so much lead as kind of like draw people to the next step. Uh, I've heard it said that Jesus kind of evangelized through fascination rather than like clobbering over the head. So if there's somebody who's maybe believes in the existence of a God, but not really doing anything about it, I might say like, yeah, it might, might be worth exploring some spiritual practices, some like, you know, prayer. If, if you believe there's kind of a God, you could pray, ask, okay, God, if you're out there, please show yourself to me. Um, and then I might have a patient who's like a pastor or a former pastor, and then I'll go really in there with the Bible and, um, kind of talk more heady theological stuff because they're they're kind of at, that's where they're at so kind of meeting patients where they're at and um talking about I, I tend to talk a lot about out of the box ways to connect with God um encouraging patients to listen to Bible reading so they can close their eyes really meditate imagine it um or encouraging people that Prayer can be drawing, running, dancing, screaming, singing. Um, I'm also trained in spiritual direction, which is kind of all about uh, helping people listen for the movements of God in their lives. So I incorporate a lot of that as well for people who who share that they they that they pray, they have a relationship with God. I try to explore what is God telling you these, what is God showing you these days, um, and and I end up praying pretty often for patients as well, which is always cool. And I think the big reason why I haven't burnt out is that I'm not trying so hard anymore. It's just, I realize that God is partnering with me, not because he really needs me, but more for like father daughter bonding. Like if you're a parent and you, maybe you, you bake with your child, they're just making a big mess and really it'd be faster and cleaner if you, you just made baked it yourself. But, but the parent wants to do it with the child because it's a bonding experience and doing something together. So that's kind of how I see um, my work these days. Wow, Sue Ann, thank you. Amazing. Um, please stick around for the q and I think I think folks are going to have a lot of questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, our final panelist is Jesse Thomas. Jesse is the National Director of Programming for Students and Residents at Christian Community Health Fellowship, CCHF. Um, Steve is our, both of our bosses. Yay. We love Steve. Her heart has always longed to help young adults live out the gospel. She received her master's in religious education at Trinity International University in Illinois, and she's worked over 25 years in church and parachurch ministries. She has lived in rural Appalachia for over 20 years while her husband, Joji, takes care of the most vulnerable doing full spectrum family medicine. They have three adult children. For fun, Jessie dabbles in the culinary world on Instagram at just soul food. You can look her up and loves a good dance party. She's also been on the staff of Chopped. If you've ever watched Chopped, she has had something to do with Chopped in the past several seasons. So she's a real Renaissance woman. So Jessie's going to um, talk about CCHF and what the students' op opportunities are there to help kind of learn, see, witness, um, understand more what Christian healthcare looks like um, from a student perspective and as you go through your career. Take it away, Jess. Thanks, Laura. It is great to be with you all tonight. Um, mine is not going to be too lengthy. So if you want to take your phone and do the QR code on there, then I don't even have to talk because I'm like, oh, it's all on the website, but I will flesh it out <laughs> for you. So um, I don't know if Steve said that our, our mission at CCHF, we envision a movement of God's people who choose daily to promote healing in marginalized communities in the name of Jesus. And therefore, what we've been hearing tonight about Esperanza is just one of many clinics around the country that do this type of incarnational 
um, work in you know all different communities. I love um, I forgot who said it. Like I think it was Amy that for two months that they uh, are given Spanish lessons. Um, but in other clinics that we have, it's different refugee immigrant populations. And so I know like our clinic in Nashville, they actually have, they do such good work amongst the pagans that, that it is noticed. And Vanderbilt, that does like, doesn't want to have Christian influence really, is like, please, Salome, we want to partner with you with our language lab and help you out. And we want to send students to do rotations. And so when you are doing work in the name of Jesus with such excellence, people notice. And then they're like, well, we don't care that you're Christian because we know that you're actually um, taking care of people. And so I feel like it is this big witness. So do as Jesus did. So as Christians, that's what we should be doing. It's not about uh, what we do on Sunday mornings or if we're in a small group, it's what we do with our whole lives. And I think some people confuse missions and being missional, and they think missions means like a two-week trip somewhere else, um, doing a pop-up clinic or something. But as we read the scriptures, we kind of see people who are living for the kingdom of God, living it daily. And so when we look at Jesus, what? how did Jesus take care of those experiencing poverty, lacking access to resources because of their race, religion? gender, history, geographic, location, et cetera. So when I speak with students, um, I challenge them like, are, is that how you're thinking about your life and how you view Jesus? And then if we, if if the term Christian means mini, mini Christ and we're supposed to be mini me's of Jesus, well, then this is what we should be doing. So um, a little about me, uh, I work with students nationally um, so we don't have a whole staff that works with students, but we rely on our CCHF members to disciple, to mentor, and we, that's why we ask our providers to please let students shadow them, do rotations with them, because CCHF is not about Steve and me and like a couple other people that work for us. CCHF is the whole community. So the emphasis is on fellowship in that we are connected with each other, but community because we all are part of the body of Christ. So here, um, one of the things I do is I go to campuses and speak um, with our partner ministry. So we're partnered with MCO, MCF, uh, InterVarsity, CRU, NAVS, uh, CMDA. So we don't... Um, we, we know that there are students that are plugged in either to their churches or campus fellowships at their respective schools, but many of them say, I'm the only one that thinks like this, and I thought there was something wrong with me, and then they find the CCHF community, and they're like, oh, I'm not the only one, like there's more people out there. So this top picture is uh, we do a student like cohort at our conference, and they become the volunteers to help run, help us run the conference due to the very generous generous donations of people. And so we have offered a reduced rate for students and then we house them together. So all the students listening here, if you're looking for like, I don't know exactly where I am necessarily on my vocational journey and my spiritual journey of like what God's calling me to do. If you come to the conference, you're gonna meet like 60 other students who are encountering the same thing. And then you're going to go to the residency uh, exhibitors and talk to like a dozen students at each residency booth, uh, residence, and hear their stories and then meet mentors, people who are in the field around the country that are doing this work. Um, so we try to have this tie with students and I um, pray for you all, send newsletters and try and engage students so that they are, and then I network them. So yes, there are some students who will send me more regular emails, but more than that, I'll be like, hey, you should meet so-and-so because they either are at a place you're thinking of or went, had the same kind of story that you have. So that is why student ministry is so important to CCHF, to our community, um, because it's like we get to see God continuing to work over the generations because CCHF has been around for 40 plus years. Um, and so 
some, I just was on a meeting with a bunch of university staff and they're like, what's the distinctive at CCHF? I'm like, um, in a nutshell, I would say healthcare justice. Like, I don't, I don't know how else to like really in a nutshell say it. Like what we do is we read scripture. So he's shown you what is good and what the Lord requires of you. So the Lord requires Christians to do justice because we live in a world of injustice. And it was the church and the people of God that was called to fill in the gap. So in this realm, we're doing it in the healthcare realm um, to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. I actually had a message from one of our students saying, I've only met CCHF providers who are really humble, but I haven't met that many. Are they all like that? I'm like, yeah, they're they're kind of all like that. I mean, I've I've met many providers and I've not met one yet that I'm like, mm, watch out for that guy. Like all of them that I've met, like walk in humility because they don't like it's it's a privilege that they get to do this. Not that it's easy, but it's a privilege to get to do this type of ministry. Um, so for students specifically, we have uh, cchf.org. We have a student tab. It says, I think students and residents, and you'll see all these opportunities. Oh, wow, MCO is at the top. Um, but you know, having students come to SMI in the summer, but there's other summer programs around the country as well, because SMI cannot take every student. and um, we kind of are like the networker, like uh, commu connecting students with the different opportunities that are out there. So clinics and ministries will tell us, hey, we have a summer program or a volunteer program or a gap year program. And then I make sure the students have that information. Um, this year, we're having poster presentations at our conference. Why? Because students came to us and said, hey, I can't get time off from school. But if I'm presenting a poster, my school will give me time off. I'm like, oh, well, then if you're doing like research on social determinants of health, our clinics would love that information. And so we're starting that this year and we're hoping to grow that. Um, we do have residency programs that are connected with us where students who are thinking, I want to learn how to integrate spiritual care with like technically taking care of my patients physically. Um, we have so many residency programs, both secular and Christian, that are partnered with us. And the secular ones, it's that there are Christian faculty there that want to disciple and pour into the residents. Um, and then student debt. Some students are like, oh, well, I don't, I'm not really thinking about missions because of the debt. I'm, I'm going to talk about later, like debt management. But we, um, I really encourage students to apply for National Health Service Corps um, scholarship or loan repayment when they're working for us. Um, there's medicine grants. So there's different ways that if if money is the obstacle to missions, then something's wrong right there because I don't know what Bible you're reading. Like money should not be the obstacle for you to serve. Like God's going to make a way for that. Um, uh, a bunch of our clinics have gap year opportunities, volunteering. Um, so we try to let students know about those resources. So if you know any students um, and your provider, send them to me, send them to the website. Um, the biggest thing is the, our conference. And so this is the real push. We have had not a huge presence of Philadelphians at the CCHF conference. But if they knew what they were missing, because I would say I came from a very conservative, high church background. And this is the most Holy Spirit led thing I've ever been to, where divine appointments are happening all the time, where students and I and it's not I, I do I dislike this phrase of and then God showed up I'm like mm, my Bible says Jesus is there all the time I don't I don't know what you mean he showed up what it is is people come to this conference ready to listen to God they come to the conference um prepared they come to the conference releasing like okay God I'm like Palms down. I, I'm not, I don't want to hold anything. I want to give it all to you. I want to be in a place where I can hear you speaking through every situation, whether it's an actual speaker running into somebody, the exhibitor, like, and everyone walks away like I heard God in some sort of way. And so we bribe students to come to the conference by giving them scholarship money. Um, and they eventually become like almost like a cohort because they find their people, 
then they start clinics, they go overseas together. Um, so yeah, uh, I forgot. The one thing that I want to emphasize is that CCHF, some people say, oh, you're the domestic mission. We, Stephen has told this uh, to many people, God is not about U.S. versus overseas. God is a global God that cares about everybody. And the U.S. is part of the globe. And I don't know about the older people on here. You don't know what's going to happen the rest of your life. Like you don't know the different places God's going to call you and what he's going to do and the circumstances of your life changing. And so, yes, CCHF clinics technically are in the U.S., except they're not. Like we even have one in Nepal and Oh, Steve, where is that? Is it in Senegal we have one? But like one of our clinics in New York has satellite Sierra, clinics. Sierra Leone and Democratic Sierra Leone. Republic of Congo and Nepal, yeah. Yeah, and so because immigrants came to a clinic and worked there and said, hey, can we open a clinic where our people are over here? So, and then between refugees, immigrants, the world is coming to the U.S. And so there's opportunities with complete unreached people. I mean, like if you have Uyghur people coming to our clinic and there's like zero Uyghur Christians, uh, we, are do we are doing global missions, right? Um, we talk about the need that's out there. The, the shortage of primary care providers is scary. It's like, it's like literally scary. Um, I live in rural America with my husband um, in Appalachia. We, it's called Appalachia down here in Tennessee. Um, and so, yeah, it's the darker the color, the worse it is. Um, when you talk about behavioral health, the darker the color, the worse it is. It's terrible. And so we need people to fill in these gaps. Um, when I talk to students about their lifestyle, some people think making less money means you limit your lifestyle. But we see this as, you know what? you increasing your choices and freedom when you say all my money belongs to Jesus, everything I have belongs to Jesus and Lord, not my will, but yours to be done because I serve a God who cares about abundance and joy and um, an abundant life. And that's not tied to any of these brand names. And so I, I challenge the students, if, if your goal is to like get a brand name, anything, then your patients end up becoming the means to what you want as opposed to you're here to serve and to serve missionally. So um, with that, if you're a student, I wanna get connected with you and get to know you and my email's there. Um, if you are a provider and you have students shadow you or precept with you, send them, send them to me and I will continue to like bring all the opportunities to them. Thanks, Jesse. Just also wanted to mention um, the Summer Medical Institute coming up this summer for um, uh, pre-med, med, nursing, dental, all sorts of students. Um, you may think that, um, that uh, even as an upper level student, you can't do it, but you may be able to do it as a rotation and get credit. Um, we do have um, a letter that we send out that, that lets people know what, what SMI does and how it talks about healthcare disparities, helps how it helps um, to address healthcare disparities, um, how it does um, uh, blood pressure, uh, diabetes, um, and those types of screenings, and um, how the students get um, lots of education as they as they go through the program, and how how uh, upper level students get extra responsibilities for actually giving lectures and doing some of the teaching. And so a lot of the schools um, will give credit for that, either in a family practice elective or um, a community health elective, um, something like that. So, and also Esperanza, I know has a mentorship program that has one or two openings in it still right now. So if you're interested in um, becoming part of the Esperanza Health Center mentorship program, there are um, some openings to be had there. So let me know. Um, or let MC, just let MCO know if you're interested in either one of those things. Um, mcophilly.org, director at mcophilly.org, info at mcophilly.org. Um, we can we can set you up for those things. Um, do we have? Uh, I would love to spend at least a few minutes here in in Q and A. Um, we did get quite a few pre-submitted questions, um, and they tended to cluster around two types of subjects. 
Um, one of them was, and some people have addressed this, how actually do you witness um, to patients or how actually do you incorporate it in the exam room, in the dental chair, in your interactions with patients and colleagues? How do you incorporate um, um, letting people know that uh, you are a Christian believer, you, uh, you, are, you, are, you are open to having spiritual conversations, um, and that you're open to prayer, you're open to praying with them. How do you do that? Um, and then the other set of questions tended to focus around um, burnout, how to avoid that, how to deal with that, um, carrying suffering. Um, healthcare folks um, at minimum have secondary trauma um, um, when they see the suffering of their patients and the suffering of their community. How do you handle that, deal with that without burning out? Also, how do you handle, deal with um, church involvement, family involvement? How do you balance all that with the demands of a healthcare career, particularly in a Christian setting where you're wanting to serve more, where you're wanting to be um, more of um, more open with, to other aspects of the lives of your patients and not just what happens in the exam room? Um, how does that happen? So if there's any folks on the panel who want to jump in and express kind of how they handle those two kind of sets of topics. Um, I could kick off some of it if you, if I need to, but if there's anybody that wants to volunteer and folks did put some of that in their, in their presentations, but if they want to be a little bit more explicit, that'd be great. Steve, you want to say something? Right. I'm the non-provider on the call. And so I'll tell you how to bridge. <laughs> You've observed it though a lot. I know. <laughs> I have. I, so let me just say there's a lot of good ways to address spiritual issues and spiritual health with your patients. Uh, I think a couple of things that I think you have to recognize, like if we really believe what we believe, a person's spiritual health should be a vital. You wouldn't see a patient that you didn't take their temperature, that you didn't know what their BMI was. You wouldn't see a patient that you hadn't seen their blood pressure. And in the same way, like it's got to be a, it, you, you have to think about this as a priority. And if it's a priority, you'll figure it out. Okay. Cause you're all, cause you all passed, you know, organic chemistry already. So that's the hardest thing you'll ever have to do. So this is uh, like, you can figure it out, but it, there's a number, um, there's a number of really good programs out there that teach methods to do this, that give you tools. Providers hate doing something they haven't been trained to do. And I think that's a great, I don't want my provider doing things to me they haven't been trained to do. Um, but so, you know, I would rec I would just encourage you, you can go on the CCHF website and you can find links to a number of different programs out there. CMDA has a program out there. Uh, METS is a really good program that teaches that kind of thing. I've seen some really simple things. One of the most effective is to, um, I, I think one of the, one of the, one of the mistakes that I see docs make uh, in patient care is they feel like in order to have a spiritual conversation with their patient, they have to take off their white coat and put on a white collar. And uh, you don't have to do that. And you, in fact, you should honor the doctor patient relationship. And, uh, and so I, you know, I've heard uh, a real simple thing that, that uh, some docs have done really well. And that is just in the course of their, um, of taking a history with their patients, they'll just, They'll say, uh, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rank your own spiritual health? Uh, you don't have to explain why you're asking that question um, because there's studies that show that over 80% of your patients, whether they consider themselves religious or not, really believe that their spiritual health is as important as their physical health. And they really believe that you as a provider should be talking to them about it. That's, that's, these are Hopkins studies. On this, and so um, you won't get pushback, um, you know. I, and I know you're thinking, well, 
you live in Memphis, Tennessee, and that's the buckle of the Bible Belt. But we have we have clinics in Albany, New York, and Buffalo, and New York City, and Philadelphia. The Esperanza people tell you the same thing. You don't get pushback if you're genuine and if you're respectful. Um, and so to ask the question on a scale of one to 10, how do you rank your own spiritual health is the opening question. The next one is the most important one. And that is, tell me why you gave yourself that score. And suddenly it opens up a doctor patient relationship that is, that gets into uh, and begins to expose some spiritual issues that you can then address. And, um, and, and you can do it in a, you can do it in a 15, 15 minute or 10 minute patient encounter. Um, it's not impossible to do. So I don't, that's just one thing, but I'd say get some training, make it a priority, get some training. Don't feel like you have to be something you're not. Mm -hmm. Those three things. Right. Yeah. I would also, I like Sue in strategy, um, like where you're, you're, you're opening a spiritual conversation without kind of telling them that you are. <laughs> um, I talk about when peds in particular, I talk about support systems. So what's your family support system like, like, for example, if something should happen and take, you know, mom ends up where she can't, you know, she broke her toe or she can't, you know, she can't do what she normally do, would, would do. What do you do? Do you have neighbors? Do you have extended family? Do you have a church? Do you have, and I, I always throw church in there. <laughs> um, and to try to see if they bite on that at all. And if they say, no, you know, if they say, oh, it's family. Well, okay. So um, do you, so you don't have, are you, do you have a faith background? Are you not involved in a church right now? And, and, you know, just to further explore that, like, tell me more kind of questions um, about, about why they didn't say church, or if they don't say neighbors, well, are, do you feel safe in your neighborhood? Are, are things okay on your block? You know, whatever their answer is kind of, you know, um, um, further exploring some of those responses and why they responded the way they did. Um, I don't do that for every single patient, every single visit, but I do try to um, make sure my spiritual histories, um, we have a blessings uh, for us at Esperanza Health Center, like, like Steve said, spiritual history is important. It's a JCO requirement, actually, if you know what JCO is, the, um, the um, organization that, um, that, um, that, uh, uh, um, the credits hospitals. credits hospitals and clinics. Yeah. Yep. So you really should be taking a spiritual history and finding out what people's spiritual backgrounds are. So I do try to keep my spiritual histories up to date, but in pediatrics, I go about it kind of more from a social work support system um, and use that as my opening to, to throw those questions out there. And then, you know, tell me more or, Hey, let me, you know, Oh, you are interested in church. Well, let me, what, what type, you know, and just asking more questions, depending on what kind of answers I get. Um, I quite often um, try to connect people, connect patients to other um, people who are interested in church. Like if I have a patient, if, if I'm asking a patient about church and they say, uh, I don't have anywhere to go, but I'm interested, um, I'll literally grab a coworker that goes to church, maybe in the nearby area and introduce them to the patient. And that coworker is always like, here's my number, here's the info for my church. And because I find that having like somebody that's kind of looking out for you or a personal contact helps. I've even, I'm a little bit extra baby. Or if there's a patient that goes to a church and, but they haven't really told their church what's happening or their pastor doesn't really know what's going on. Like maybe they've been really busy. I have asked for their permission, like, hey, how would you feel? Like, if you want to, I don't mind calling your pastor and letting them like, you know, asking them to check up on you at some point and letting them know, I don't, I don't have to tell them details of what's going on. I can just say, Hey, maybe give this person a call if, if I have your permission to do that. Um, so I've done that before. I'm calling up a pastor to be like, yeah, but maybe call this person. I've even, um, <laughs> um, there, there's this one woman in ministry in Kensington, a certain neighborhood of Kensington near a fifth street office, who's just like a legend. And I don't even really know her personally, but she is a legend. And I was trying to help find like a like a social support for this one patient. She trusts no one. She, she's young. She's a mom. She's overwhelmed. Um, and I'm like, she doesn't go to church. I'm racking my brain to think of like who can support this this young woman. 
And then I realized she's from that neighborhood. And I'm like, hey, do you happen to know who Miss Darlene is? She's like, yeah, I remember Miss Darlene when I was a kid. I went to her, you know, stuff. I was like, hey, so like, if you want to, if I can get Miss Darlene's number, could I call her and give her your number? And, and she was actually okay with that. Like she like did, trusts no one, but she was like, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with Miss Darlene calling me. So I think in that sense, knowing the community and being networked with mini other ministries and churches really helps a lot. Um, um, to get patients connected as well. And then in terms of, I, I, I'll straight up ask a patient, if the patient has mentioned prayer or mentioned God, I'll just ask at the end, like, can I pray for you? Um, or if they really haven't, if it's not clear, I might just say it like, hey, you know, like here, as Christians here, we believe in the power of prayer. Would it be okay if I pray for you now? Or, you know, I could also just pray for you by myself, like in my office, and we don't have to pray together. And most of the time they're cool. People are cool with me praying for that. I think I've maybe have been denied like once or twice. And then once or twice because the patient didn't want to cry because I prayed for them before and they cried. Like, I can't cry today. So sometimes I'll say no. I'm like, all right, I'll pray for you later on my own. But I I find I find that with prayer, if again, if you're like present, listening for God, listening for the Holy Spirit then that creates space for, for, for someone to encounter God. Like I was saying how, you know, we can't change external behaviors, but we could create space for people to have an encounter with the God who transforms and heals and redeems. So just like even just creating a little bit of space, even for a few minutes. And quite often when I pray for patients, I'll, I'll include the gospel and I'll, I'll mention how like, you know, thank you, Jesus, you're carrying our pain, you carried our sin, but also our pain, our suffering, our illness, and you died, but you rose again from the dead, you won the victory over all this stuff. And, you know, through faith in you, we can also be more than conquerors, we can experience healing. And so I incorporate that in my prayer. And there was one time where I was saying that, and the, and the patient actually yelled out, yes, I want to accept Jesus. So I derailed my prayer. I'm like, okay, now, we, now you're praying, we're going to pray for accepting Jesus now um because that was I wasn't expecting that in that moment so but that was a really cool moment when that happened um so yeah like creating space and 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 using prayer even just briefly to to kind of um review what what Jesus has done for us and and what we have you know as people of faith and quick, I would also say oh go ahead I was gonna say a quick comment I find that a lot of um providers uh, you know, they're unsure about how to broach, even in settings such as Esperanza, uh, the spiritual life. So one can default to prayer at the end. Now, the bad part of that is that sometimes when we default to prayer, we can short circuit having a, a, a more in-depth uh, discussion. But it's not a bad place to start. And I say that. So let's say you ask someone, and as most people here would mention, you know, 99 out of 100 people will say, yeah, that's fine. You can pray for me. <laughs> um, and if, if nothing else, out of politeness. Um, and then you ask, well, what could I pray for? Which is what most people do. And they'll say something. Now, sometimes people will say just kind of very general things. But oftentimes, they'll say, pray for my son. Now, you could just leave it at that. And, and sometimes that's all you have time for. But a way, I think, into... Um, engaging the spiritual life with people is to find out why are they concerned about their son so ask them, well, why do you mention your son or how could i pray for your son so i give an example we we uh i was uh doing the shadowing training for one of our volunteer chaplains it was actually a medical student who went through smi uh and um she was kind of nervous so i had already uh, talked to some patients and then she watched me and then we switched so we came to this woman who was in the uh, waiting room, and this was a very hardened woman. Um, so we, she started talking to her, and this woman just was not interested. And so she said, she just asked her, okay, so um, do you think we could pray for you? The woman said, yeah, fine, although she wasn't all that eager. Then she asked her, well, who could we, is there something we could pray for? And she said, and she began to name some people in her family, and then she completely changed and she started to cry. And then out of that came this whole discussion about what was going on in her life related to these people. As it turns out, she had lost three people very close to her in two weeks. And, um, and, then, and then 
there was quite a rich discussion at that point, and then we actually followed up with her afterwards. So I just mentioned that is that if if you you know if a person feels well, at least I can ask people, can I pray for them? There is that extra step if if you have time or um, the the ability at that moment is to ask what to pray for and then why they mention whatever it is. And it's a remarkable thing how much of an entrance into the spiritual life that is. So the person may say, well, my son is, um, you know, it's oftentimes happens uh, someone has really drifted off into addiction or something. And then you begin to ask how they feel about that. And, and, and you can begin to talk about the love of God and how he has also lost us. Uh, but he hasn't given up on it. And, you know, all, all kinds of things that can, um, based on what their concern is that they might mention in a, in a very, what seems um, pedestrian question about prayer, the world that it opens up with, in, with someone that even you might never have met before that day. And I would also add that because you're in a secular setting, most students are in a secular setting. Don't think that you can't do this. If you ask, if you if you've established some sort of relationship, if you've asked permission, if you've asked maybe a spiritual history, if you've kind of gone down that path a little bit already, just as part of your regular work, um, as long as you ask permission, it's okay. Um, you may want to be discreet. You may want to make sure that you know if you're in an if you're in a hospital room in the middle of a you know ward, you might want to make sure um, that not a whole lot of folks are around. But um, um, you can do it. It's okay. It's allowed. Um, and don't be don't be afraid. And and um, one point, one of our the guys that teaches um, Josh Wee, who's a geriatrician at UPenn, teaches our spirituality in medicine uh, part of SMI, and he is like. Um, you know the Christians are the cultural bridges. So, so if you're in if you're in West Philly, largely African American community, um, older people particularly are churched. Um, not necessarily the younger generation, but there there are people in the family that are churched. Um, they may not be believers as we would call them, but they are at least churched. Hispanic North Philly, largely you know it, largely Catholic. They're churched. So talking about spiritual things and having a spiritual conversation is nothing that they find unusual or foreign. They like, like Steve said, people want to know that you care about that. Um, so students on the wards or in the clinics that are Christian that are kind of thinking about this and have, have some experience doing it, maybe have some comfort doing it, can be the cultural bridges for their care teams where as they're going around and rounds or as they're presenting patients or as like I know how to communicate with this patient on this topic you may be your patient but let me help you I don't know it, it, he mentions that as a as a as a as a way of being an ambassador um, and providing that bit of education or a bit of that cultural knowledge that you have um, about your community um, to your to your clinical team in, in the hospital, that that's perfectly appropriate to do. Um, and um, so don't be afraid to volunteer to do that. Anybody want to uh, uh, address the question on burnout and or avoiding burnout and or getting burned out, but then getting filled back up again, which is probably what happens more often than anything. <laughs> um, you do get burned out, poured out, but how do you fill yourself back up? Where do you go? I can address that real quick. I'll have to piece out pretty soon here. But um, uh, I definitely, yeah, I've been there. Um, definitely been, been burnt out um, in, in some extent or another. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, Go ahead. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the only answer I can really honestly give is, is that thankfully God is faithful to um, keep, to, to check me and to, to help very amazingly, you know, gently remind me of um, 
just the ways that <clears throat> um, burnout really results in, you know, idolatry and that I'm, I'm looking at myself and looking at how overwhelmed and overworked and overstressed and underslept um, I am. Um, and it's, 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 it's a lot about me at that point in time. And <clears throat> I, I feel like I don't have anything more to give to my patients, which is true. <laughs> it was, it was true before I went up, before I was worked out too. Um, and because, you know, I, I'm, I'm, and I'm, 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 I had not been looking at, at Christ being filled by him and, and having him be the conduit between me and my patients. So, um, is, that's, that's a safety for me. That's strength for me. Um, and that's, that's, that's healing for my patients really, you know, so that's, that's, um, that's a general vague thing. Um, I think that tools to help with that, um, are definitely having, um, a Christian community and, and openness and, and accountability with people who are, who, who know you and are, are able to speak into to your life as far as, um, definitely, you know, a spouse or a partner, um, or, uh, Christian brothers, brothers and sisters who meet with you regularly and can see um, when you're like, you know, when I'm slacking on on the things that I are important for me to be doing to to or just signs that I'm, you know, I'm keeping my keeping my eyes on Jesus. Um, and there's lots of other little tools that that can can be helpful um, as far as setting boundaries, as far as work and when you work and when you don't work and I'm having set aside time for, for Sabbath and for um, those kinds of practices and tools as well too, which are, are helpful and important. Um, but yeah, they're, 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 they're no substitute for fixing your eyes on Christ, so. I once but, saw, that, oops, go ahead. I was gonna say, I have to actually hit on everyone though, so sorry. Yeah. So I would also say if folks need to go, I know we're, we're over hour and a half now approaching two hours. So if people need to step off, that's great. Um, that's fine. We won't, we won't consider you <laughs> rude or anything like that, but if folks want to stick around and keep talking, we can do that too for another 10, 15 minutes or so. Okay. Um, yeah, Jesse. Tom and Cynthia Hale were missionaries in Nepal for 25 years, and they've written a number of books, and um, Cynthia was my mentor at one point, and we were really burnt out because the reason why I think a lot of people in our community get to that feeling is because we don't go to work, work nine to five, and go home and rest. Like, we're all entrenched in the community. It's our neighbors, you know, when we go to the store, like, it's all around us, and it doesn't feel like there's much of a break. And so I was talking to Cynthia about that because I mean, if you're in the foothills in Nepal, in the foothills of Mount Everest, I would assume you also don't get a break there either. And I, and I was like, this is what we're feeling. And she's like, well, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, why would you ever feel like you'd get burnt out because you're continually being filled by the Holy Spirit? Oh, that's, I don't like that answer. <laughs> And so I really was stopping to think. And so I think one of the things is when I've seen overseas missionaries um, look for support, they're sending prayer letters all the time and asking for prayer. And they may not, they're not actually so super vulnerable in their letters. They'll allude to things. Um, but that's like our opportunity to like, wait, you said things weren't going so well. What are you talking about? What can I do? I think our providers need to have that same mentality as overseas missionaries of who's our prayer support. Because if we don't have our own personal support team that like prays for us, that's outside of our bubble, we will automatically get sucked into the, no, it's me doing this. I'm, an, I'm constantly doing it. Um, and so there are people that I have told, hey, if you're in a situation where you need prayer, just text me and say, just pray. Like, you don't have to explain it to me, tell me the details, because that's not what you need. Like, God knows those things, and you just need an army of people praying for you. So that is a strategy I highly recommend, is reaching out to people who will pray 
and having the system like just pray and then later they can explain it or not explain it but that's not what they need now they need your intercession so that is my strategy for trying to stay filled with the holy spirit yeah it seems to me kind of the what we call the ordinary means of grace um staying connected to the body making sure you have people praying for you I couldn't do this without my small group. Um, my small group pays, prays for me regularly and I share prayer requests with them. Uh, Sabbath, communion, um, uh, daily prayer yourself, uh, in, being in the word as much as you can be, even if it's short, but try to make it daily. Um, um, just the regular stuff um, and and cultivating those disciplines. I, I use the word discipline loosely. I mean, I'm not very disciplined. <laughs> um, um, but just knowing that those are the things that are going to sustain you and figuring out, you know, what your top three are and don't, don't let those falter, you know, make sure you're invested in those, whatever those three are. Um, yeah. Um, because you will, you will be, you, you will be poured out. You will be tired. You will be discouraged. You will be overworked and underslept, as Dom put it. <laughs> um, but where do you go? What do you do? How do you give the control of the patient up? I know Sue Ann mentioned she just and Dom said, you know, we we don't we don't cure anybody. Um, God does that. So we just do what we can do, and then you just got to let the outcomes go um, and leave those up to Jesus. So, yeah, go ahead, Andres. Yeah, I was going to mention something. This is kind of a maybe from a bigger picture perspective, and hopefully I don't step on any toes here, but I think um, it's important to understand that we are not special in what we do. And what I mean by that is I, I have several doctors in my extended family, and just on a general worldly level, there's a, an ethos that medicine is very special compared to a lot of other things. Then on top of that, you you add the, the Christian perspective in it, it becomes even more special. And then, hey, we're working among the poor. We're even more special. What we're doing is high stakes. We're on the cutting edge. We're doing what um, few people dare to do. And so we better step it up and take it seriously and, and go full out. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, I, my point is that, um, what all Christians called to do, assume, assuming they're not doing damage or doing something ungodly, is special. Uh, there's a guy in my church who works as a security guard, and he has to deal with all kinds of problems with dealing with the public and so on. It's not necessarily easy. There's another guy who worked for years in a cheesesteak freezer factory, which was unbelievably difficult physically. Um, all of these, I think, particularly in the perspective of the the Protestant Reformation view of, of the holy life, these are all holy vocations. And so I think that there could be a view among Christians working among the poor in some way marginalized, which is a very strong element of the identity of what we do, that we're kind of cut from another cloth. And, and what we're doing is more special than uh, a lot of other things that might be going on in the world. And uh, I think we have to kind of maybe have a humbler view of what we are called to um, and that that can help a lot in, in dealing with um, that sense of having to kind of knock it out of the park all the time. The other part of it, I think, is that um, there can be an emphasis on, this was in some of the questions that, that people, you know, that we're exposed to all of this suffering and difficulty and so on. And, and there's a lot of truth to that, but I think that, um, Mentally, in terms of our framework and our spiritual imagination, I think that it's it's helpful not to view it excessively as being defined as a setting of suffering, but rather um, that it's very multifaceted. And in all of these lives where there is maybe a lot of suffering, there's a lot of um, wonder and uh, remarkable things that God is doing, even in very simple things, but sometimes very dramatic things. Um, and to not kind of in our, the way we kind of bring in experiences, not to overemphasize the, the, the suffering aspect or the pain 
at the expense of seeing the wonder and the beauty and the ordinary um, life experiences that are, are, are gifts. So um, I think those two things can help a lot in, in, um, in, in some aspects uh, of how we, we deal with all this work that we're involved in or uh, uh, that can contribute to, to uh, burnout. I'm not saying these are the only aspects, but uh, I think they do contribute a lot from what I've seen with people and myself. Right. That's even one of the trends in, in healthcare today, at least in pediatrics, is, is emphasizing resilience and um, emphasizing the strengths of the, I mean, yes, of course, you need to deal with the problems they're dealing with and deal with the deficiencies, but emphasizing what they're good at and commending that and using that to deal with some of the other, other things in their lives. Um, um, the resiliency model um, is something that's been going around, particularly in adolescent medicine for the last mm, eight, 10 years or so, getting kids to kind of focus on what they're good at and um, um, leverage that to deal with some of the harder things that they're, that they're, that they're having to go through. Some patients will pray for you and that's really nice when that happens. We have to learn to receive. Mm -hmm. That's something I really learned when I think when I moved to Kensington is to learn how to receive. I used to be someone who would never ask for help. Um, not so much out of like pride of like, I can do it myself, but more just this fear of being a burden or a fear of, of bothering people. But I kind of learned to receive because the person giving wants to give and they want to love you. And it's not a burden for them to love you. So it's like, let, let people be there for you who want to be there for you. Um, and, 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 and accept people's generosity. Like anytime I ate a meal that I knew was made from a neighbor's limited uh, food stamp supply, I knew how costly that was. Like, I'm going to eat that meal and enjoy it. I'm not going to say, oh no, no. Like, you know, I'm going to receive that gladly and just be thankful that they want to show me love in that way. And, um, so yeah, I think that's important as well to learn to receive. Any, I also okay. highly recommend personal retreats. Like a lot of Catholic retreat centers have a lot of space for anybody to come, even if it's just for a day to just get away from everything. Um, so I try to do like a, like a silent retreat once or twice a year. And I try to spend time in nature weather permitting most weekends. Any any questions from the folks that are logged on? Don't feel you have to, but you are welcome to ask away. Any any prayer requests from anybody? Mm -hmm. We always like to end in prayer as well. I guess <laughs> I've been like secretly texting Amy <laughs> under <laughs> um, because I'm interested, of course, I'm in dentistry. So I'm just trying to figure out like the future in terms of should I specialize or should I specialize in pediatrics or something like that? So um I think this whole journey, uh, I've, I'm a career changer. So I previously was a violin teacher for 10 years. And I, um, so this, this change for me was definitely, I think God led and God opened so many doors. So I'm just trying to seek his like will in terms of like my role um, in serving like the Philadelphia population, um, because I do live in this area and grew up in this area. So just trying to figure that out would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. And then, yes, I have met you. I'm the violin teacher, I remember. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course you went into dentistry. That's mm -hmm. perfect. <laughs> All right, so we'll pray for that. We'll pray for everybody, too, also trying to figure that same kind of what does my future hold kind of path and what where is God leading me?
All right. Um, John Esterhai, can I ask you to, to close in prayer and mention um, Joyce's request of future direction and how to serve in Philly? And also um, pray for our other all the students on the call kind of similarly. Are you able to do that? Absolutely. My um, pleasure. Um, and to introduce John real quick, he's on the MCO Board of Advisors and former professor of uh, orthopedic trauma surgery at Penn. Our Lord and our God, <clears throat> we come before you this evening as your children. Um, thankful for the gift of your son, thankful for this call, and for the opportunity to serve. Uh, we serve and love you because you first loved us. And we thank you for calling us to this service. Uh, I'm sure that most people on this call can identify uh, how you've impacted their lives to lead them to this point tonight. We thank you for the topics that have been addressed from future work in service, how to deal, Heavenly Father, with the needs of society, our society that has so much potential, and yet we choose to allow it to remain broken. Uh, the violence, the disparities, Heavenly Father, the hatred, uh, the sheer disinterest in you. Please forgive us, Lord. Help us as a nation to repent and turn from our wicked ways and seek your face. I pray this evening specifically for CCHF and for MCO, for all of the young people on this call, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to nurture them, help them to start each day on their knees, seeking your will for their lives for that individual day. Um, help them uh, humbly, as was already mentioned this evening, to um, do this work with uh, open hands, knowing full well that it's your work and not ours. I pray for our patients that you would help us to know how to speak into their lives, how to speak into the lives of our families, Heavenly Father, um, to encourage them, to love them, and to show them Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen.